All right, we're recording the screen right now, everybody. So Odette, go ahead. All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to today's digital event presented by the Maynard Institute for Journalism Education. It's a conversation with ethnic media leaders on their lens, their perspectives, their coverage of this moment in our history, of this movement for racial justice, and also the deep impacts of COVID-19 on communities of color. I'm Odette Alcazar and Keely. I'm the director of the Maynard 200 Journalism Fellowship Program, and I'm privileged to co-moderate this session today with our MIJE co-executive director, um, Martin Reynolds. Martin, I am uh, energized to be with you with this session today. Oh, I'm, I'm pleased to be with you as well. And with you and with our co-ED uh, of MIJE, Evelyn Sue, and our entire team, we'd like to thank our distinguished panel of speakers uh, from the ethnic media. Their voices, their perspectives, their work highlight the crucial role and the continuously evolving role of ethnic media as vanguards of news and information for their diverse audiences, crucial more so now in this pivotal moment of our dual crisis of this moment in our history. Um, this conversation is part of the Institute's series of digital events that are aimed to provide information, diverse perspectives, resources, and support. And in our recent ethnic media spotlight pieces, we were also able to highlight the reporting from African American media, the voices of African American media, and also Native American media on the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 on their communities. And for the latter sector, that included voices and reporting from Indian Country Today, from the Navajo Times and Indigenous Media Freedom Alliance. The core work, the work of ethnic media is, is the foundation uh, in my own media background. I was the former executive producer and anchor of the Filipino channel, ABS-CBN International. And also after that, I served as the National Media Network Director for New America Media and Ethnic Media Consortium. And its work now continues through ethnic media services. Both organizations are represented today on this panel. And speaking of the panel, Martin will be uh, kicking off our discussion and introducing our first speaker. I wanted to take this moment and give all of you an idea and a quick introduction of our four panelists that you'll be hearing from in this session as well. Rong Xiaoqing is a reporter for Singdao Daily in New York, veteran reporter of this uh, ethnic media outlet, and she's based in New York. Her, article, her articles have also appeared in the New York Times, Foreign Policy, South China Morning Post, and many others. Maria Alejandra Bastidas is Vice President of Digital Content of MundoHispanico.com. She's based in Atlanta, and she's a digital media expert, speaker, consultant, and success strategist focused on leadership, women and girls empowerment, and also the Latino market. We have two Maynard 200 alumni uh, on this uh, session, on this panel, and Maria is one of them from the advanced leadership track from the class of 2019. Troy Espera is her fellow uh, Maynard 200 alumni. Uh, Troy is a Maynard 200 class of 2018 alumna alumnus, and he's the head of news production for North America, abs Ben International, the Filipino Channel, and uh, he leads an award-winning news and documentary team and has been in charge in creating new markets, including a new digital brand called Tayo, uh, meaning us, Tayo News. And lastly, Sandy Close. She's the founder of Ethnic Media Services based in San Francisco. She's the former editor of the Pacific News Service in 1974 and was a pioneer in developing youth media in the United States. She's the former executive director and founder of New America Media. Um, just before I throw uh, the, or turn over the floor to Martin, I wanted to uh, set the stage and talk about two data points. Just a few days after George Floyd was murdered on May 25th, and which started what we see now as a global revolution against racial prejudice and institutional violence, the nation passed the grim marker of more than 100,000 deaths from COVID-19. There's a recent uh, news analysis coming from ABC of arrest data voluntarily reported to the FBI in 2018 that has surfaced recently. And this was reported by thousands of police departments across the country. It revealed that in 
800 jurisdictions, African Americans were arrested at a rate five times higher than white people. And that's after accounting for the demographics of these police departments in the communities that they serve. And in one recent example of a trend point showing the disproportionate impacts uh, of the coronavirus pandemic brought about by the systemic disparities that affect ethnic Americans, a recent study of California COVID-19 patients published in late May in the journal Health Affairs found that African Americans have almost three times more uh, odds of being hospitalized when compared to non-Hispanic white patients. These data points show us the dual pandemics of our time. And these contexts and issues have been covered by ethnic media journalists for decades. Thank you, Odette. I want to just give folks a quick uh, housekeeping note that if you have questions, please pick up the, put those in the chat and Ava will be monitoring those as well. I uh, also want to let folks know that our panelists are going to do four minute introductions after I do a brief open. Uh, and then we'll have a series of follow up questions and then you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. So please put those in the chat. So like the nation, journalism is at an inflection point. The pandemic and killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and a seemingly endless list of black men and women and people of color has continued to lay bare the deep racism and white supremacy and health and wealth disparities of our nation. This at a time when many newsrooms themselves are in crisis. Some of that crisis is financial, but there are two other crises of our own making that we face as a profession. It's a lack of trust and a systemic lack of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our newsrooms. I say systemic because as I posed on Twitter yesterday, saying that the soul of American journalism is at stake, and that truly is in this moment. And as a profession, we must reconcile that we are part of the very system protesters across the nation and world are pushing back against. And I'm speaking of the larger we, as there are certainly sectors of news, such as those folks on the ethnic media space that we're featuring today, that run counter to the oppressive systems that people of color and indigenous folks have to navigate, which is why their voices today are so essential. We have to ask ourselves, and I'm borrowing from a framework that Dr. Glenda Wren, who's actually a physician, came up with, and she talked about how at this moment in time, are you going to be a sustainer, a facilitator, a denier uh, or uh, of, of white supremacy and systemic racism? And journalists have to ask that themselves this question at this time. Ethnic media plays a critical role in the larger ecosystem and has always positioned itself as of the community, not apart from the community. And mainstream media would do well to learn and to listen and to collaborate with ethnic media to meet the challenge of our day. So the Maynard Institute has been around uh, and fighting to make America's newsrooms reflect the diversity of the nation since nine diverse journalists started this organization in the wake of the Kerner Commission report that turned 50 that called out journalism as complicit in its inability to effectively articulate the true stories behind the unrest of the civil rights era because mainstream news organizations lack diversity. And ironically, if you read that report today, you would wonder if any progress has really been made. So much is still to be done and we're navigating another kind of civil rights movement in this country that centers around health and wealth and state sanctioned violence against people of color. There is a movement in the streets and there needs to be a movement in our newsrooms that reflects that movement. And so we have an outstanding panel. And I want to jump right into it now with our first guest, uh, Khalil Abdullah, who's based in DC and a contributing editor. And um, Odette already introduced him. And so Khalil, I wanted to hear from you first. And um, as mentioned, Maria uh, Bastidas is gonna have to jump off shortly. So we wanna make sure that all the guests holds to their four minute um, answers in this initial round. Um, Martin, I, yeah. I, I apologize in interrupting. Actually, I held off in introducing Khalil. Please go oh. ahead and, and give us um, um, your quick introduction of Khalil. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. So, so Khalil Abdullah, who is a wealth of information, he's contributing editor, ethnic media services, and the former managing editor of Washington Afro and former executive director of the National Black Caucus of State Legislators, um, in his new position, he'll be starting soon as the associate editor of the new North Star. So we're really fortunate.
opportunity to have him. So thank you, Odette, for, uh, for letting me know. So overall, I wanted to get a sense from you, Khalil, as to what did you see in the Black press in terms of angles and areas of focus uh, that were covered as this initial, uh, as, as George Floyd's murder occurred and around the pandemic that you believe were not widely covered by the national mainstream media and that were missed? Difficult for me to, to really comment on the extent of mainstream coverage because uh, I think the story was so dynamic and and so um uh it's hard to to frame the language for watching someone die on the street mm -hmm. uh on a video um so I, I you know i don't think it's really that they missed the coverage of the event itself it, it's really more about the the larger context and the history of um, how African Americans are perceived. Um, you know, I was doing some background research, and there's so many people that have contributed to the collaborative mindset in terms of doing this analysis. So, for instance, I was looking at a TED talk uh, where the speaker was saying that, you know, there's been a history of equating, you know, people who have melanin with criminality. And that is reflected clearly in the mainstream press. And, and that, that is a divide in the media coverage in terms of ethnic media are typically leaders in their communities. They know people, they know who's who, you know, they know who the rabble houses are, they know who the wallflowers are, but, but they are leaders in their community. And that, that's something I learned uh, even to a greater degree uh, in working in, in at New America Media some years ago with Sandy Close. Um, so it's not that they missed the story, you know, it's it's that they missed the context of the story. Mm -hmm. And and that is a continuing problem, and it's a continuing problem that is not solved simply by hiring an African American journalist. And I don't want to say tokenism here, but you know, diversity of gene pool does not equal diversity of thought. It's, it does not equate. Um, you know, and, and typically people hire people who think like they do. So there's a vetting process that takes place, and this is no um, disparagement on NABJ, National Association of Black Journalists. That, that's not the direction I'm coming from. But I'm saying if you want to expand the news lens, you know, deal with people who know those communities well. That's how African-American reporters first got into mainstream journalism was a result of riots during 1968 after the King assassination. And they didn't want to send a European American into those communities and be at risk. So they had to hire the folks that were doing the, had been doing the drudgery work and doing the hard work from the Afro, historic publications been published since the 1800s. And I think, as I recall, is the longest running family owned publication in the United States of America. Started out as a church bulletin, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, it's how to frame the question is, is, is a difficult issue, um, particularly when people don't know our communities, haven't engaged in our communities, or as, as, as Sandy would say if she were here, if you haven't broken bread with somebody, sat across the table, got to know, you know their ethos, their perspectives. So if journalism is supposed to be about the truth of things, okay? And we know there's subjectivity and objectivity, but I mean, we have a country where we can't accept fact. We, we have a country where we cannot accept facts. So you have, this whole ethos that begins with the education system by the omission of African-American history, by the omission of Latino history, by the omission of Filipino history, by the omission of Chinese history. I'm talking about the history of people who live here and who are Americans, right? They don't show up in the educational context and in the classroom. I didn't find out about Tulsa, Oklahoma until 1985-86 by a reporter, former reporter, African-American state legislator. If you want to know who put Tulsa, Oklahoma on the map in terms of the historical record, it was a reporter. 
Don Ross, former state legislator from Tulsa. He is the one that chronicled the history of his grandmothers and his neighbors and his friends and put together the Tulsa story. Other than that, that story would have been lost, lost, okay? So, you know, we have to get closer to the ground. We have to listen to the voices of young folks, different zeitgeists. I mean, I have grandchildren. I mean, at this point, I have great grandchildren. But the point is, is that, you know, I was talking to, to, to my grandson, and I'll say for the record, yeah, he beat me in the handball game today. But I asked him about Attica. He had no context of what Attica meant. You know, but that's a major story. How did Attica come about? Well, people wanted to get the bad actors out of their community, out of sight, out of mind. And I remember meeting uh, in the 16th Baptist Church in um, um, Alabama, in Birmingham, the church that was bombed, right? And listening to an African-American state legislator talking about, we are complicit. After the African-American community is complicit in this whole incarceration uh, arc started with Attica, upstate jobs program for farmers. Now we're we're at prison privatization. You know, shout out to Douglas Blackman, uh, excellent journalist, one of my heroes. Right, slavery by another name, slavery by another name. So you know, we buried the past because we don't want to accept the truth. Right, and you know, I'm I'm going I'm not watching the clock, so I'm waiting for you to. Yeah, you know, you, you got about another, is, wrap it up in like another 30 seconds. 30 seconds is, if Harriet Tubman was here, she would say, put George Floyd on a $20 bill, because that's what his life was worth in America. Right. Good way to wrap, and a tragic, but well said. Odette, thank you, uh, Khalil. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, Khalil. Uh, Martin, I'm going to uh, now... Uh, turn this over, turn the conversation over and ask our main question to Maria Bastidas. And uh, Maria is joining us right now um, and has been so gracious in, in giving us this time. She does need to urgently jump off uh, pretty soon. She's gonna jump off a bit earlier. So we're gonna make sure that we're gonna catch Maria and her main points and perhaps even a question or two uh, from the chat box as much as possible uh, before uh, she needs to jump off. And we started this conversation with the frame of the dual pandemics uh, that we are seeing, uh, the dual crises that are hitting our communities of color, uh, the, dis, uh, the systemic inequities that are causing the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 on uh, ethnic Americans, but also now in this movement for racial justice, this pandemic of racial oppression. And Maria, I wanted to ask you, with this long history of the immigration marches uh, of 2008, of uh, the separation of families in the border, of the kind of uh, grave impacts uh, and, and many not widely reported impacts of the pandemic, including the economic fallout on uh, undocumented immigrants, for example, within the Latin and Latinx community. Um, what is the resonance of, of this uh, national and global uprising in the fight for racial uh, justice? Thank you, Odette, and thank you for inviting me to be part of the panel. I'm super glad to be here sharing Mundi Hispanico experience and what we have lived during the last month. Uh, of course, that you know, in the last in the last week, covering all the movement for racial justice has been part of the coverage. We've been out there looking at the, uh, along the protests. We have been reporting what's going on, and we have noticed something that really interesting that we didn't see many Latinos out there in the streets. You know, we saw uh, massive amounts of Latinos out there in 2010, in 2008, when they were uh, marching for the, for the comprehensive immigration reform. But this time, we didn't see them. In Atlanta, just for to mention some, some data, for, from the 500 people arrested, only nine were Latinos. And we couldn't find them. And when we were doing the report out there, reporters were there, and they couldn't find Latinos out there. We know there might be financial reasons behind it. We know there might be say, safety issues behind it because we know you know Latinos don't go and confront police because they fear deportation, they fear for their lives and for their futures. So these might be some of the reasons why we didn't see that on the streets, but on social media platforms, on social media channels, we saw things very differently. We saw a, a huge spike in comments in support of the Black Lives Matter movement 
we saw images, engagement, people uh, commenting and liking and sharing like never before. So we really see something going on more on the social media than on the streets, but we see more Latinos involved. We also saw a uh, nonprofit organizations raising their voice. We received uh, for, uh, press releases from the National Hispanic Leadership Agenda saying 40 organizations, the top organizations across the country, uh, united, expressed their support to the black community in the fight for their rights, and we didn't see that before. So we have seen some uh, some improvement in Latinos joining, you know, the racial justice movement, and we were reporting, you know, during all this time. We know that we all suffer from the ongoing lack of respect to our community and to our people of color. It happens to Latinos every day out there, and that's the reason also why leaders and activists were calling on Latinos to join, you know, to work hand in hand with communities of color. You know, they were asking us to go out there and protest in the line, or maybe go ahead and vote. That is something that we really need. Also, more Latino participation in the in the in the vo in voting, and also you know participate more actively in the Congress and in the halls of the Congress. So that's part of the coverage we were doing on the racial justice um, recent protests that we were covering. Maria, just before we we talk to you more about your coverage and the pandemic impacts, I think there was something that you caught, Martin, that may 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 be serving as a factor in, in the deterrent in the physical presence the the significant uh, lack of numbers in the physical presence of latinos yeah i was curious maria we had heard that there was some reports on ice uh being at some of the at the many of the protests or some of the protests and i was curious if that's something that you had heard of and if perhaps that may have led to some of the the lack of participation on the part of the latino community in physical protests I think that absolutely could have affected. We also saw some report about it. We didn't see them here in Georgia, but we know they were present in other parts of the country. And of course, that's something that really scares the community. You know, Latinos, especially when they're undocumented, they tend to not get noticed, you know, to stay in the shadows, to try not to, avoid, to confront the police. And of course, being out there in the process will, will allow them to be seen and we, they could be a risk of being deported. So that definitely could be a reason why Latinos were in the joining. Mm -hmm. Maria, I just wanted to draw in Troy here, uh, Troy Spera. Troy, I think you were also hearing that fear amongst the Filipino undocumented immigrants in, in the community, something you also reported on in your channel. Yeah, thanks, Odette. Um, yeah, that's true. We had been um, hearing grumblings from nonprofit groups that we um, are connected with uh, who advocate for the undocumented community in our it, it, within our uh, the Filipino community. And so, yeah, they're saying that there's some fear about attending uh, rallies, demonstrations, uh, because there was an ICE presence there. So there was a lot of warning. People were warning one another about it. So yeah, I would say it's consistent with what Maria was observing. And Troy, we're going to circle back with you in terms of your coverage on, on uh, these two crises, but want to circle right back to Maria with the time that we have with you. And again, uh, Martin and I and our colleague Ava were at the ready here for I any had a question. I, I had a follow-up question, yeah. So Maria, what did you attribute uh, the, the rise in um, social media participation around this issue? Because clearly it struck a nerve, but I'm curious as to what about, um, why do you think it happened there? And what do you think about what has happened led to it um, emerging there, particularly around Joy Floyd's murder? I think that, you know, since all media was covering it and it was so, you know, the images were so, so, so hard to see and so appealing, you know, I think people were moved more. We also, you know, we know the community is every day, every day more on social media channels. So everyone was sharing, everyone was commenting. And I always believe that the social media has a lot to do, you know, with how the movements will 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 grow because it's the world we live in now. And I know Latinos are very active in social media, it's their main media of communication. So we not only saw that happening on Instagram and on Facebook, but also on WhatsApp. On WhatsApp channels, they were sharing videos and they were sharing comments. And WhatsApp is a, is a platform that we use a lot to communicate with families in our countries. So we noticed that it wasn't only like a US thing, it was a, mm -hmm. a, an international movement of Latino sharing and commenting and supporting uh, that, will, that, that went across, you know, across borders. And I think that's because we, we, we face it and, and at a different time in history. And I think that we saw more real how, how hard it was. And we saw a bigger movement of people going out and, and, and 
maybe we felt more inclined to join, you know, because we said, wow, mm -hmm. this is happening here. This is, this is not, you know, I'm from Venezuela and I have many people calling me from Venezuela. They, hey, what's happening now? Are you in Venezuela? Are you back in, in the country? And I was like, no, I'm here in Atlanta reporting from, yeah. from downtown Atlanta and nobody could believe what was happening in this country. So, you know, we were trying to raise awareness and, and share more information. And I think the more information available and the more social media content available, the more, the more people we saw joining, joining them. Just a last follow up to that. What do you think the, the outcome for your community will be? What, how, do you, how do you think this is gonna manifest itself in the community's own activism in service of its members of its community? How do you, how do you envision that may uh, what what might emerge? Uh, what might change? Is there going to be a, a different sort of sense of, of activism and uh, assertiveness as a result of this? I'm just curious as to how will this translate for your community as it seeks to address so much of the issues that are being uh, directed at it, particularly as a result of this administration? I think that the participation in the government is where we're going to see the impact. We saw so many people asking Latinos to go out and vote to go out and register. We had elections here in Georgia just this Tuesday, mm -hmm. and we saw so many Latinos like, hey, this is the day to go out. This is where we express our view. This is where we change the country. And, and I think it will, it will move towards that, toward more Latinos joining, more Latinos voting, more Latinos getting registered to vote. And I think that that's part of what you know the community, we as a media and the organizations are trying to move the community towards. Gotcha, thank you. And uh, this is the chance, uh, as I mentioned, our colleague Ava, together with Martin and I, we're monitoring the chat box. Uh, if you have a question for Maria before she uh, jumps off. Uh, and as we do that, Maria, I wanted to circle back with the frame of our conversation. Now in terms of uh, the disproportionate impacts, those deep disparities of lack of insurance access, healthcare access, education, high paying jobs, nutrition. Um, we, we saw essential workers that come from uh, the communities of color. And this I know is something that you closely track at mundohispanico.com, including the economic fallout and including what you just uh, have mentioned in terms of the uh, deep uh, impacts for the undocumented immigrants. One of them, I think, Mundo Hispanico has been at the forefront of this issue, which is the fact that mixed status families, uh, if, if even a U.S. citizen married uh, to an undocumented immigrant, that is uh, impacted by in the way of their access to the stimulus checks? Yes. You know, we were very actively reporting, especially on financial and economic and the struggle that the community was going through because the pandemic really affected Latinos at all fronts in unemployment, you know, in the lack of jobs, entrepreneurs having to shut their doors. So it affected every, every part of our, of our community. But especially when we were starting report to report on the stimulus check and the people that was going to receive it, there were two conditions that we heard in the beginning were going to happen. The, the only people that was going to get the check was people that was citizens or, or with green cards. And the reality when the checks came, it wasn't, it wasn't the truth because families with mixed status never received the money. So if this is a US citizen married to an undocumented Latino or undocumented person in the country, they were not allowed to get the money, even when they had children. We know the story of these, uh, there's you know 1.2 million of families with mixed status that didn't get the, the stimulus payment. Uh, that was that was sent a couple of weeks ago. So this was a big news for the community. No many media reported on that. That was something that the community felt was super unfair, especially because other people without legal status in the country, people without green cards, just in process of having their documents uh, re legalized, they were receiving the money. So there was people that were students, there were people that were in the process of getting a green card, and just because they had social security numbers, they got the money. But Latinos, you know, undocumented people that was married, and even Americans, you know, every, anyone married to, a, to an undocumented person were, were uh, prohibited from getting the checks. So now there are lawsuits in the, in the, in the, in the government, you know, there is a, a mixed status family lawsuit and also the U.S. born children lawsuit against the government asking them to, you know, to give them the money that they deserve because they said this is an act of discrimination uh, based on, on marital status. That yeah. they were, they're being discriminated because they married an undocumented person. Wow. I know you got to go, Maria, but there was one really good question directed at you, and I hope you can answer it quickly. Uh, this person writes that a newsroom where he works 
or they work, I'm not sure of the, the gender, a newsroom where they work has translated occasional resources, particularly around voting and around frequently asked COVID questions into Spanish. And they saw some use and got some positive feedback, but there was a feeling that they have missed the mark with some of what they've chose to translate. He want, this person wants to know is that, do you see a primarily English publications doing occasional Spanish language coverage well anywhere? And do you have any advice for organizations on story selection or distribution? I I I don't know about many you know like uh, English media doing uh, Spanish. I know they some 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 his, some uh, mm -hmm. big media have their Spanish publications that sometimes I'm yeah. I independently and I think they're they're doing good. And what was the other the other question? Well, just getting a sense of I mean the the thing that I've often they just wanted to know if they had any advice uh, for uh, distribution of Spanish language content. Uh, mm -hmm. when it is translated from English to Spanish. That's probably a little bit of competition for you, but curious as to if you would have, if, if English language publications have something they think would be of use to the uh, Latino community, do you have any suggestions on how it ought to be distributed? I think that, you know, social media channels are the best way to do it. And sometimes partnering with other media can work. You know, sometimes we receive content from other, other sources and we distribute our, our platform as a distribution channel just you know when there is content that is really valuable to the community and we don't have it or if something that is interesting sometimes we partner with organizations and we share the content so i i'll be sharing reaching out to other latino media asking them to share the, the the content or just sharing the content along social media platforms boosting content targeting and getting getting latinos okay thank you so much thank you so much thank take you. care thank you so Bye. much your time and what we'll, we'll do is we're going to make sure that we also grab and collate questions that may be addressed to you Maria and and we'll uh, make sure that we connect you to those participants that have questions for Maria and Mundo Hispanico. Martin I'm gonna uh, let you ask okay. the main question to Rong Xiao Ching, reporter Singh Yao Daily. Hello hey Rong how are you doing? Hey Martin I'm good how are you? So, so good to see you and so appreciate you taking the time today. Sure. The question I had to, uh, wanted to ask you and get your perspective on is that, so we saw attacks against the Chinese and Asian American community members since really maybe January, late February, and especially after the coronavirus was racialized by President Trump. So we wanted to know what stories did you focus on and what was happening in Chinatown in New York City and what were the perspectives that emerged uh, that you saw that folks need to know about and perhaps may have missed? Yeah, I think when you ask this question to Cleo, uh, um, I was thinking about this. I think Cleo said something that's very good. I, I completely agree. He said, it's not the stories that the mainstream media didn't report, it's the context. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, in, during this uh, pandemic, you see that the mainstream media did mention that the Asians are donating PPEs to the local hospitals. And you also see they mentioned that the Asians are attacked because of uh, you know President Trump's Chinese virus and things like that. Um, but, but that's basically it. Uh, they, there is not even the connection between the PPE donation and the uh, racial attacks against the Asians. And I decided to um, you know during this pandemic to ask. Almost everyone I interviewed who are donating PPE, whether they have been attacked, guess what? Nine out of 10 people I asked had a personal story of being attacked. They, nine they, out of 10? Yeah, nine out of 10 people. Who are, who, th these are only the people who are donating PPEs. And they were either um, at uh, U-Virus. They were either called U-Virus, go back to your own country, or uh, in a very severe case, this uh, uh, New York University student, freshman, he, uh, while he was purchasing something in a grocery, a guy came toward him, caught him virus and poured a half bottle of mineral water into his mask. So the mask is damped, he was very uh, frightened. And so the student just ran out of the grocery. That's the whole thing, but, um, after the pandemic, um, I mean, uh, not after, but during the pandemic, the protests um, triggered by George Floyd's death started. And we as a community, um, 
have for a long time have been trying to answer the question where are we in this um, racial justice debate mm -hmm. right um asians you don't see many asians in police brutalities right. um uh but on the same time you know there there is the uh, model minority uh, of course Right. So, so a lot of people think, oh, Asians are, they're just quiet. They are law abiding people. They never get troubled and they get into Ivy Leagues. That's the story they're thinking. Um, but during this, uh, during this pandemic, during the protests, how do you connect the racial attacks that Asians suffered uh, because of the virus and the George Floyd's pro protests? and the police brutality. How do you make a connection between uh, the two? That's what we have been doing as uh, Chinese language media. Indeed, there is this uh, very uh, sharp and fierce debate between a group of Asian, mainly first generation immigrants, and uh, second generation, uh, their second generation children who are born and grow in this country, over whether we should support the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Mm. Um, so this, the nuances in this debate uh, is so interesting, so rich. I think it it's, it's totally will shape the, uh, the path that the Asian community is will be taking in the future in the whole social justice uh, background in the whole uh, pursuing of social justice. But none of this is reported in the mainstream media. Right. And real quick, because I know Odette's going to have a follow-up question, but I wanted to have ask one first, which was, so what, what do you find the nuances to be in that regard? I mean, can you define the tensions a little bit between the two as obviously these attacks were going on? So the, obviously the community felt the effects, right, of racism and has for many years. But what are the nuances between that juxtaposition between those two communities do you see? Right, I, I think the first generation immigrants uh, who grew up in China in a totally different cultural and political system tend to uh, approach uh, the, the, the tax that's against them with things like, uh, you know, as I mentioned, donation, a PPE donation. They mm -hmm. feel, you know, they, they're, I think their mindset is if we do better, people would accept us. Um, but the second generation who grew up in this country um, and has been immersed in this uh, racial culture here understand that that's not enough. That's not the case. If you are a person in color, people will, will see you that way, no matter how good you are, no matter whether you send your kids to, uh, to the Ivy League or, or not. So the second generation's approach is we should stand up. We should speak more. And we should stand together with the black folks um, to fight for the equal rights for everybody. Mm -hmm. So the debate between parents and children are focusing on this point. And I, I can see like at this moment, they come, none, neither side can persuade the other side because mm -hmm. they have such a different background in history and culture. But during these debates, you do see like people start to listen a little bit more than before. Mm. So that's where hope plays. Thank you. Thank you. And and wrong. I do have that follow up question. I also just want to make sure that I acknowledge uh, Paul Clayman's question, a former colleague as well, and and it touches on ageism and it touches on the deep impacts of COVID-19 uh, in this moment in our history on the elder population. And I think that's a question uh, that I might be asking the panel to give some inputs to, um, especially with Sandy and the work of Ethnic Media Services. Wrong, everything that you nuanced uh, also uh, very much impacts the Filipino American community, um, other Asian community groups that were all impacted by the way this virus was racialized by the president, as Martin mentioned, but also it tracks back to our own histories of exclusion in, the, in every diaspora of, of Asian communities. Um, with, with the Chinese American community, you have the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, you have the internment of, of the Japanese community in World War II. Uh, 
you know, I'll be asking Troy some comments on this, but in the first waves of migration of Filipinos to the United States, you had some signs up um, in those times that says, no dogs, no Filipinos allowed. We have those moments in history, moments of our exclusion and wrong. I, I wonder, I, we've had some conversations about the intergenerational divides and the different generational sentiments of solidarity with, with race relations and with the Black Lives Matter movement that you were seeing in the Chinese community. Well, I, I think you mentioned something that's uh, very interesting that the, um, the Ch Chinese uh, Exclusion Act and uh, Japanese internment, and all of those are considered very important history by the second generation, but not as much by the first generation. I do feel the reason is, is um, for the second generation, they know that Asians are always alienated. No matter how good you, you are, um, you're considered as foreigners forever. Mm -hmm. um, but for the first generation, perhaps they accepted this as default. They are foreigners. Uh, you know, even after they're naturalized, uh, naturalized, they still consider themselves more Chinese than Americans. So things like this may not be as um, jarring to them than their second generation. I feel maybe now you inspired me. I think this might be a reason that there aren't so many first generation participate in the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is some connection to that. And it's interesting to see those generational divides, something that Martin talks about very deeply in, in the generational divide and fault lines as well. And we'll talk more about that. And so I wanted to draw Troy in uh, and talk to you about the kind of solidarity, the kind of sentiment that we were seeing in this massive uprising against racial oppression amongst the Filipino community members. What kinds of stories did you feel uh, were important to tell about how the Filipino community as a population was reacting? What lens and what perspectives did you feel were important to show in your co channel's coverage? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Odette. Thanks, Martin. Um, we we really we immediately saw our young people coming out of quarantine, taking to the streets in solidarity uh, with Black Lives and denouncing pre police brutality. And I really have to give credit um, to Khalil's point earlier. I want to give credit to the scholars and the students in our community who. Um, it's because it feels like so much of the organizing and the expressions that we're seeing around this issue, it, they feel informed by historical context. For example, and this is what I mean, um, on Wednesday, just here in San Francisco, there was a group of dozens of marchers who organized under the moniker of Philippine X for Black Lives. They marched through downtown San Francisco to Kearney Street to the site of the I Hotel, which um, in the 70s was the scene of a really violent protest um, for uh, Filipino elderly men who had been living in this hotel. They were being ejected from their homes and um, there were violent clashes with the police during that protest. Black activists and uh, Black students, they were there. They came to the protest and they, they, they fought alongside with the Filipino community, and they fought for us. So the marchers on Wednesday, they really saw, uh, they pointed to that moment as a very powerful example of how um, solidarity works. And for them, this now is the time for them to, to, to show up for the Black community. And now it's their turn to, to pay that solidarity back. So we're seeing lots of examples of this type of thing in, in the stories that we're reporting on from our younger audience. Now, it is a bit different in our first generation immigrant segments, the immigrant segment of our audience. And um, to be honest, we're not reporting on major acts of overt racism that uh, from this part of our audience, but even without empirical evidence, of these, uh, we know anti-blackness is an, it really is an issue uh, among the first generation immigrant Filipinos because it's their kids who are calling it out, right? Mm -hmm. So we've been reporting on this push for uh, 
folks to have tough talks within their homes, within their families about race and anti-Blackness. And it's really the young people that are coming forward and they're saying, hey guys, let's take a look at this. Let's talk to our parents. Let's talk to our grandparents and our aunts and uncles and unpack these misperceptions that they're hanging on to. And they're not only doing that, but they're creating art and they're creating tools uh, for free to share with each other through social media so that those conversations can be facilitated. So it's been pretty inspiring this, to see this. So important to see this response from the community. Troy, I'm going to circle back with you a little bit on those intergenerational divides and the kind of community response because also it's impacting you directly as an editor in one aspect of this in your work. There is a quick, if you would allow me, there is a quick circle back and, and, and a quick follow up that I wanna make uh, to wrong. And on behalf also of Malcolm Barnes, Malcolm, we actually perhaps saw the same news item. I saw it as a video piece, a wrong, I, I saw this on one late night and perhaps it's something you are covering in Singdao Daily in New York and all of the other publication um, uh, editions of Singdao Daily. Um, there has been a, a, a big uh, a series of assaults and uh, verbal racial attacks against uh, people of African descent, uh, black community members who are in mainland China who are not being allowed into restaurants, who are being denied access to hospitals, um, who leave restaurants and, and, and the places are being sanitized as if uh, you know, they're lepers of the plague. And, and, and um, even if they have a need, they're being uh, really verbally and, and uh, racially assaulted uh, for the color of their skin. Is this something that you were seeing and something that you're reporting on as well? Yeah, um, I also noticed those incidents as well. Um, I think China has been changing constantly. When I was in China 20 years, 22 years ago, um, there wasn't such an idea or concept as, as racial uh, discrimination or racist, because at that time, there were very few opportunities for ordinary people on the street to see anyone who are not Han Chinese, which Han is the main uh, ethnicity in China, which take probably 99% of the population. So uh, for people growing up in that, uh, in, in this uh, monologue um, kind of uh, uh, environment, they really, their lack of uh, sensibility to racial issues. And now China is, uh, is stronger. So a lot of people uh, from other countries going to China. For the first time, people over there started to encounter um, with you know, people who look totally different from them. Um, and, 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 and discrimination is not has not been uh, absent in China at all. You know, even before they see people uh, who skin in different colors from from their own, there is geographic, very like uh, overtly uh, geographic discrimination. Like Beijing people will look down on Shanghai people; they'll look all look down on the countryside people. So now, with this different group of people, uh, different ethnicities, race um, people coming to China. All of this start to boiling up and turn into uh, racism uh, per se. But a lot of this, I would say, is rooted from uh, the original reason is misunderstanding and ignorant. I'll give you an example. In 2018, the, the Spring, uh, Spring Festival Gala of CCTV, which is the biggest uh, festival gala. We almost like everyone in China would have to watch it every year. That's their celebration. So in that, it's like a, a short play, stage play, uh, talking about the relationship between China and African countries. And they, well, it's all like a very upbeat, positive, uh, uh, atmosphere, but they had a Chinese actress paint their uh, paint her face uh, black to uh, to perform as a as a black woman, and they had a black person um, put on some costume 
um, to to perform as a monkey. This is a completely uh, racial mind line uh, they they are stepping in, and I would say if you say this is a pure racism, I think it's more like uh, ignorant. Because, you know, if they have any sense, any sensibility of the racial issue, they won't have put these kind of uh, uh, arrangement in a, in a program which meant to promote China's One Belt and One Road, one belt and road uh, program and promote the friendship between China and African countries. So I think China is learning. Um, you know, through these incidents, they'll know like what what are the sensibilities, what are uh, the the taboos, what are things that that's uh, inappropriate. Um, so I think the learning curve might be long, but uh, as long as they're learning, you know, I'm positive for the future. Martin, I wonder, did you have a follow up question? No, I was just really struck by that story. I really appreciate uh, what you had to say there in this the because I think there is there's often a desire to have a better understanding of where the Filipino black relationship lies, where the Chinese black relationship lies. Uh, and, and so, and even oftentimes where, where the Latino black relationships lie, because there is so much of this discrimination that touches so many of our communities. How can these groups uh, come together? And perhaps what should the, what should the role of journalists be uh, in addressing that. So it's not so much a question, but it just made me think about uh, contextually to, to have a better understanding of that and, and realizing that that's not at all, uh, that kind of nuanced coverage is not available to Can I, could I ask you a question? Uh, Khalil, go can, ahead. Your can I make a comment? Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a comment. Please. Yeah. Um, so, and, and it's two, one to just wrong, um, and the Chinese African connection on the New Belt Road Initiative. And, and but I also want to address Martin's point. So let's go to Katrina. Um, I, call, I was at the Afro 2005. That was, that was the story of the year for the African American press. Katrina was it. Once Katrina, I mean, other than the election of the Pope and whether an African cardinal would, you know, be in the mix to become a Pope, uh, the Katrina story was the story, and and to its credit, um, uh, the Afro was all over that, and I mean to the degree that uh, you know connections uh, that had been made, given the legacy of of the Afro, um, they had connections in New Orleans, so so they could report from the ground in New Orleans because of those very personal connections. Um, so our coverage at the Afro was 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 pretty good, and I, I think we were kind of ahead of the curve in seeing you know the rolling disaster that was about to take place. Um, that's 2005, and I was there all of 2005. 2006, I joined New America Media uh, as the director of the Washington D.C. office. Uh, 2007, uh, I get an assignment from Sandy Close to write the background uh, profiles on the African-American media in New Orleans uh, for a symposium, a meeting where the Vietnamese journalists in New Orleans, the Latino journalists in New Orleans, and the African-American journalists in New Orleans would sit down and have a meeting. So this was an information packet so everybody would know where everybody was, in other words, you know, I'm doing a background. So I interview all the African-American journalists in New Orleans, and some of those have been displaced, as you know. I mean, you know, and, and those who had, had internet capacity, you know, they maintain coverage with the expats from New Orleans who migrated to Texas, but they still had that following because it was digital. It was a digital platform that they could move. They couldn't print and distribute in the streets in the morning, the floodwaters were still up. Um, but the point of this was, was that at that meeting, which I did not attend, I mean, I'm still in DC writing this background for this particular symposium in New Orleans, Vietnamese, Latino, African-American. The point I'm making here is that none of those editors had ever met each other before 2007. 
The, the Vietnamese editors had never met the African American editors. The Latino press had never met the African press or the Vietnamese press. So when you talk about, you know, how how do you widen the the, the lens to understand other communities if the people who are at the point at the point of the arrow in writing op-eds, for example, in wh who they choose to report on, on the incidents that they choose to cover, on how they frame those incidents. If the media themselves are not talking to each other across <laughs> that siloed universe, what do you expect from the readers? If the readers are relying on this media, we, you know, New American Media led this country in doing profiles and, and serve, and Adet knows this history, Yes. Profiles of how different ethnic groups respond to media and even how they consume media. Mm -hmm. Chinese mm -hmm. typically read print. Mm -hmm. Latinos do television. African Americans love radio. If you want to promote an African American newspaper, you get a spot on a radio dial. Mm -hmm. The Afro would go to print on an affront page. It was a trade. Mm -hmm. It was a trade. We had a reporter on the Afro every Thursday, or the editor, I had, a, I had a companion editor working with me, Reggie Williams. And Reggie would go to the studio. He would go to the radio studio and talk about what was in the Afro. He would talk about content on the radio, and then the, the, the radio listeners would say, oh man, I want to read that story. Let me go buy that Afro, right? So the point is, is that you cross-fertilize the, the, the media itself. I mean, we keep thinking about print in a silo, radio in a silo, digital in a silo. No, you cross-fertilize them. You have to, you gotta amplify those voices because you can't do it by yourself. As El Haj Malik said, El Haj Abdul Malik, you know him as Malcolm X, I know him as El Haj Abdul Malik. If you wanna hide something from a Negro, put it in a book. Put it in a book. Who's reading books? We're talking about police brutality issues in 2020. And I can tell you in 2013, there's a book called The Rise of the Warrior Cop, right? The Rise of the Warrior Cop. Go Google it. Mm -hmm. You want to know the origin of police brutality? He lays it out very, very clearly. And particularly, not only from the inception of using police as slave catchers, one second of that, but also the rise of the, militar the militarization of the police in covering the, in, in dealing with the African American community was the intersection of the civil rights movement. That's when the militarization of the police really began to accelerate. That's, I mean, you could track it. I mean, it's there. The evidence is clearly there. But the point about um, uh, cross-cultural communication is like the media itself isn't doing cross-cultural communication. And to Ron's point, I can tell you the first Mao button that I saw, and I know Mao is a hot button issue for everybody, but the first Mao say tongue button, the button, I have it in my dresser, right? The first button that I saw was from an Anglo guy who had gone to Tanzania when the Tanzan Railroad was being built in Tanzania by who? The Chinese. The Chinese are not new to Africa. That's an, that's an ancient, ancient, go back and look at the past history. Chinese, look at the population of Madagascar, for crying out loud. They have Chinese, or a quarter Chinese. I mean, you have a Chinese presence in Africa going back centuries. China is, in, China is not new to the continent of Africa. I'm, I'll leave it there. But yeah. Yeah, I, The reason I wanted to raise this point was to address Paul Clayman's point. Yes, exactly. You don't have people who know the history on your staff and you've got people under 25, they can't tell you about Attica. They can't tell you about the, the, the back stories that the young people don't want to hear. Oh, grandpa, you know, every time you talk, you got a kid the back. I'm trying to teach you something. Learn your history. You know, learn the history. Learn the facts of the matter. You know, you're, 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 you know, you're talking about rap. I mean, Quincy Jones will tell you, man, rap has been in the African-American community since the way back. I mean, I used to be called Shine. You know, go look that up and figure out who I am. You know, that's the thing that you said about pollination and cross-cultural communications uh, is at the heart, the very DNA of the work of Sandy Close. I'm going to bring Sandy in, and we'll be able to address Paul Clayman's point. Thank you very much, Khalil, because it really threads through the importance of history and the importance of, of the role of media as a landscape, as a sector, 
what are we not doing? What are we not listening to? What are we complicit to? And, and, and I think this is really a, a clear moment. I'm gonna be able to get back also to those points with you later on, Troy. But I wanna bring in Sandy Close, who founded NCM, who founded New California Media, what has then become New America Media, and that work continues in ethnic media services. Sandy, uh, you have articulated so eloquently, uh, as Khalil has referenced to, the importance of what ethnic media leaders have been saying about covering each other's backyards, about covering each other's communities. What are you seeing as that important role in this pivotal moment with the dual crises hitting communities of color? And I hope uh, Sandy can hear me. Well, well, if um, we'll, maybe we'll be able to get a sense on that we, response. Is is Sandy on the screen? I don't see her. Okay. But while you were figuring that out, let's um, go to June's question, which I yeah. thought was uh, uh, looks like it's really directed to Troy, which is um, Troy. There's a call from the Filipino community uh, to think about launching something a counterpart to Black Lives Matter, which would be something like Filipinos Lives Matter in advance to, uh, to advance the struggle uh, of Filipinos both born in the US. Uh, and this person wanted to know also, as it relates to all the, the issues happening back at home with Duterte, uh, and wanted to get a sense from you, do you think that such a proposal to advance the Filipinos Lives Matter would cause division among ethnic groups rather than advance each ethnic group's interest uh, in working together? That is a really interesting question. Thanks, uh, thanks, Kui Jun, for answering that. I'm glad to see you on here for asking that. Um, you know, I think it would cause a division within our homes, definitely. Um, just that, you know, that that divide between the first and second generation. Um, you know, that's a that's a question that we ask ourselves a lot. You know, how can we? advocate for ourselves in this uh, in this discussion about racial justice while not taking away space or attention um, from the black community who really needs our support right now. So um, that's 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 an ongoing debate. I can say that um, our young people would react to that by saying you know, all lives matter. Uh, all li no lives matter unless Black lives matter. Mm -hmm. um, we've heard, we're here, we hear that a lot. Uh, so yeah, I can't speak to other to what divisions would uh, it create with other communities, but within our own community, I think that would be a really you'd have a, probably a volatile reaction between the generations. I do see some some people would re, uh, rally around that, um, particularly with the first generation. But again, you know, that's that's going to be a really heated debate just with, for ourselves, so. Uh, and I want to piggyback on that, Martin, and kind of the thread of where we were going earlier, um, Troy, in the pain, in the darkness of what we're seeing in this mass uprising against racial oppression, you actually articulated to us the hope that is shining through. and not just the young generation, but so many sectors of our population looking at this moment in terms of how can they have those conversations within their homes? How can they have those conversations within their communities? Um, because this is not about finger pointing or, or laying the blame or wagging a finger at our own community, but you said it so eloquently, Troy, when you said we're holding a mirror up right now in, in, this, in this moment when we see the marchers chanting uh, in the streets against racial injustice, that we, what racial prejudices still lie within our own community in the first waves uh, of, of migration of Filipino families, there are those whispers. If we are taking an honest look at ourselves within our community, the whispers of who are they warning us against? And the African-American community was one of them. Um, and so that hidden, that taboo, those whispers of community members 
uh, that we were being warned against as Filipinos migrating to the United States. Is that something that you think we as community members, we as media leaders have addressed enough in our storytelling to dispel those stereotypes, to dispel those traditional prejudices? Um, yeah, well, we are definitely looking at those things and um, trying to draw those stories out. It's kind of tough to get um, folks uh, to admit to having those types of views, uh, but we do know that they are there. Um, you know, and it's not just about um, the warnings about black, uh, the black community that immigrants were getting from back home. It's also what they're struggling with is the, their perception of law enforcement, right? And police, because this brings up um, so many issues for them because they're, we're talking about a, dias a diaspora who is, um, for many of them, they're, they're from parts of areas or parts or communities in the Philippines where paying off a police officer to look the other way is part of everyday life, right? And so they come here to the U.S. and they hold law enforcement here at a, at a higher, at a, on a pedestal because they compare it to their experience back home. Um, so it's, a, it's a also about discussing, you know, how, what, re, redefining what they believe law enforcement's role in our society should be. So, you know, those are some of the talks that we're having too. Thank you very much. And I want to bring in Paul's question, really tagging on Paul's question. And Martin is the voice on this. Martin have, and, and many of our colleagues in the Maynard Institute having brought forth to newsrooms and nonprofit and communications um, uh, offices across the country and organizations, the signature diversity legacy of the Institute of Fault Lines, the six fault lines of race, class, gender, geography, generation, and sexual orientation. And Martin, you'll talk about the fissures as well. Paul is asking, it's, or, or making a, a point and a comment, it's not just aging, but cross-cutting human issues, family and children, and so much more, which he then says is what Bob Maynard has uh, laid bare through the fault lines and what, how important that framework is for both, uh, for all of us as media and community leaders, but also uh, as reporters and editors looking at issues. And Paul also adds, ethnicity is important, but um, not to get hung up, not important to get hung up on single focus debate outside of context. So Martin, just wanted to get your additional points on that. Yeah, I think that's well said. And because when we do the training of fault lines in largely mainstream press, right? But the reality is, communities of color have their own fault lines, right? Has been laid out here as it relates to generation is one that stands out in particular. And also I would imagine class. Uh, and so, so it, when you think about that, it, it's, a, it's a framework that is applicable even within ethnic media. And in some ways, the, even more so because when you have immigrants and then you have second generation, there is such a difference between how those two uh, constituencies see the world It's very powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, fact, that was, go ahead, oh, Odette. I'm so sorry, then I'll let you continue, Martin. I, I apologize. In fact, in so many of our editorial pieces in the Institute, in spotlighting ethnic media voices in the pieces I've done, in, in so many ways, when we look at the coverage of ethnic media, of ethnic media journalists that have been uh, shining the spotlight on these issues for decades, now brought starkly into focus by the murder of George Floyd and an endless string of African-American men and women, and also the ravages of the COVID-19 pandemic, that the, eth the, the, the very essence, ethnic media coverage embodies or cuts across the six fault lines and the fissures of ability re religion and politics. Just wanted that. Yes, uh, there's a great question from Malcolm uh, that uh, looks like it's directed to you, Troy, uh, which asks, uh, on the East Coast, Filipino healthcare workers, especially uh, nurses, have carved out a really important niche in hospitals and in healthcare writ large, right? And have you gotten any vignettes from these folks or even locally here about how they're navigating COVID-19 and its ramifications? Oh, absolutely. I think all of us Filipino-American media folks have uh, really been on this. Um, definitely, and yeah, definitely extends beyond the East Coast. So I would say that it's pretty much healthcare industry-wide. Um, never before, as far as I can remember, never before have I seen such a spotlight on healthcare workers and such a huge 
part of our popu of, of our community work in this industry, right? So it's been very uh, inspiring to see um, the, like, for lack of a better word, hero worship that we're seeing for healthcare workers mm -hmm. and knowing that our own family members um, are part of that. Um, are, are receiving that. It's also scary for us to see our families going in every day um, to these high risk situations and um, kind of navigating how to do shelter in place if you have to go to, if they have to go to work, what do they do with their families. So yeah, and you know, and what's, because so many of us of our community are in this industry, we see whole f families of healthcare workers that are putting themselves at risk right? Um, even contracting the virus, um, getting affected. So parents and children, they're all together um, in, having these infections and surviving, thankfully. Um, but, but yeah, we, we absolutely have a variety of experiences that we've been reported. We've been reporting on this. And unfortunately, some of those are, have been deaths to coronavirus. Um, from healthcare workers who are fighting to help others and sacrificing their lives. So it's very real for us. Wonderful. Uh, you know, thank you so much, Troy. I, I caught some of those profiles, just the way you've spotlighted um, frontline responders that come from the Filipino American community. I wanted to bring in and, and ask panelists some insights and, and maybe starting with Khalil on Paul's question about um, th these really severe impacts of the coronavirus outbreak uh, on the elderly population. And I um, wanted to just um, mention exactly what he's saying in terms of, you know, Paul Clayman has uh, written so much on this issue uh, for many publications, and he's written about double, triple jeopardy of being ethnic, female, and old. Elders are 80% of those dying via COVID, especially non-whites in Medicaid nursing homes and with higher underlying conditions. The glut of older prisoners due to racist policies is now leading them to being dumped on their families with little support. There's many examples. And Khalil, you recently wrote about the disproportionate impacts of uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic on uh, the African-American community. Um, this came from a video conference from Ethnic Media Services. Um, but within that uh, spectrum, uh, was there also additional data points and input in terms of the elderly population within the Black community and in, in other ethnic communities? Oh, and Khalil, before you answer that question, if you could keep it a bit pithy, because we now have Sandy and just want to make sure that she has a, a <laughs> moment to answer. Got it. And we'll pivot back to the cross-pollination that you <laughs> Yeah. 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 Sandy taught me about silos, and I'm, I'm so grateful uh, that I've had that this long association with her. Um, and I've been able to travel. And, you know, we haven't talked about the census at all and how, you know, the, the cross-cutting issue is how is how is the virus going to affect the census? You know, and that's 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 the beat that I've been covering. Um, but in 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 terms of um, uh, the numbers and the demographics, I mean, they're going to speak for themselves. This is a rolling disaster. It's not going to stop anytime soon. And I say that particularly for the African American community because they're primarily in the South. Um, you know, that's where the heartland is. You know, it's it's, it's the South. And, you know, some years ago, I did some work on the CDC on, on as working for state legislators at that time, when HIV was in full bloom. And, you know, I remember very clearly the map of the southern United States was red, where the likelihood that HIV rates would be high. Why? Because the STDs, the gonorrhea, the syphilis already was there, and, and HIV, sexually transmitted disease, often. Um, there's a pathway there, but it wasn't only that, it was the, the, the underlay of the lack of clinics, the lack of hospitals. I mean, you can pull up that data. There's a map of the United States that shows you clearly the underserved populations in the South and particularly African Americans. So we don't even have to go back to, you know, the, the health, lack of health protocols. I mean, go read Harriet Washington's book, Medical Apartheid. I mean, that'll give you the story. Um, you know, go go read the American Health Dilemma. 
you know i mean that's the history of african american health from from you know from the time we landed here you know so you know this story is yes it's underreported you know it's always present in the african american community but the one thing I did want to say, and there's a shout out to other, you know, and I'm not going to do the shout out piece, but you know, we haven't talked about labor, and and the, and and the, the 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 minority press and the ethnic press tend, like the mainstream press, to to not give labor its due in terms of its history and in terms of coverage. So yes, we can talk about Philippine nurses and Philippine workers, okay, but you know. That's a labor issue. Some folks in the African American community are, are being supplanted by Philippine nurses because they'll work for less money. I mean, nobody's having that robust discussion. I did want to say one thing about the Philippines, okay? Philippines didn't exist in a silo. My uncle, my uncle Leo fought in the Philippines for the liberation of the Philippines. I, I have a, a Chris, a Creed, however you want to pronounce that, that he brought back from the Philippines. He had five beachheads in that region. He had a silver star, you know? He fought in the Philippines and there were other African-Americans who fought, fought in every war, fought in the Revolutionary War. So, you know, and, and you know, I, I just want, I remember in this connection in terms of Africa and, and, and wrong, I, I won't have time to come back and, and address some of the, the other undertones here in terms of the lack of education, because we're talking about what's omitted from the textbooks, what's not there in the textbooks. But here's, 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 a, here's a perfect example, if I might, and this is, I had to learn this. I had to learn this. I wasn't, I had to learn this outside of the classroom. I had to learn this on my own, right? On my own, okay? How many Africans fought in the Revolutionary War and which sides did they fight? Well, they fought on both sides. Now, let's take a classic American film. What has become a classic American film? And please just bear with me because I do want to keep, I know I want to keep it pithy and I want Sandy to have, you know, I'll be quiet. Okay? <laughs> the, the Patriot by The Patriot, the movie, right? Mel Gibson, based on the true story of Francis Marion, South Carolina. Now, in the movie, in the movie, the bad guy in the movie, the British bad guy, rides up to his house and he sees African-American laborers laboring on the side of the house. And he says, any of you, meaning slaves, who join with the British crown in fighting against this insurrection will be granted their freedom, will be granted their freedom. Mel Gibson shows in the movie the, 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 the South Carolina uh, community of African-Americans. That's where he sends his kids to, for refuge while he goes and fights the war against the bad guys, the British. Walt Disney made a series out of this. It was called The Swamp Fox. I used to watch it as a kid in the, in the 50s and 60s, okay? The iconic Swamp Fox, okay? The movie Mel Gibson is the hero. I get it. He was he fought in the French and Indian Wars. That's how he learned the guerrilla tactics to defeat the British Army. This is true, all true. What I couldn't understand is that when Gibson opened the door to this African American presence, okay, they weren't included in the rest of the film. They had one African American who fought in the movie with Mel Gibson, the good guys, the Americans. Okay, here's what I found out in doing the research. He didn't want to open that board that door because the Africans who fought, because there was no America then, the Africans who had been brought here, who fought for their liberation, who joined the British troops, right? Who joined the British troops, fought with the British. This became the incident at the end of the Revolutionary War where the British officer said, because the, quite frankly, I'll use the N word, and I do use the N word. The Americans said they wanted their niggas back. Those escaped captives, that those that left the plantations to go fought with the British, the Americans said they wanted them back, okay? And here's what the British officer said, and you can go look it up. It's on record. It's a famous statement. I gave my word as an officer of the British crown. These people are coming to me on this boat or the war will not end. And they got on the boat, they sailed to Britain, and those became the people that settled Sierra Leone, okay? But here's the Here's the kicker, the kicker. You go Google the Mel Gibson story, go Google Francis Marion. 
and by the British, he was considered a war criminal. And why was he considered a war criminal? Because he summarily executed any African American who was found or suspected of fighting with the British. Khalil. 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 I'm done. And thank you so much. Uh, and also your point about labor as an aspect. We look at this as a continuing series of conversations that we're going to have with ethnic media voices like you. I want to bring in Sandy to the points that you made earlier. And um, Sandy, in drawing you in, Khalil really articulated as well that, that core framework of cross-pollination of, of what you have done in founding NCM and founding New California Media and what be, then became New America Media and the work that continues with ethnic media services of, of bringing editors, reporters, publishers uh, of different ethnic media organizations in rooms where they had never seen each other before, never heard each other's stories, heard each other's perspectives. And I wanted to ask you, Sandy, as you look at this moment in our history, how important is what you have expressed, what ethnic media leaders have expressed as that core notion of covering each other's backyards, of covering each other's communities in this moment in our history? And just before you start, uh, Sandy, so glad that you're here. We just wanna be respectful of folks' time and we have about three minutes left. So right. we're gonna to go to you and you are gonna be the final word of wisdom final for word. us, well, which is with, perfect, uh, with which is perfect. With a huge apology, oh, no, please. Uh, a Go huge ahead. apology. We sent out an invitation to all our media yesterday mm -hmm. to remind them about today. And in my mind, I had it next Friday. I don't, it's, okay. it's called mindsets. Okay. Don't worry about it. Just uh, I feel so badly because <laughs> what you're doing is exactly the, uh, what, what really the kicker for me, the thing that really uh, inspired me f for so many years was the idea that all of our media were working collaboratively across racial and ethnic lines. People would say, oh, it's um, mainstream media connecting with black media, connecting with Latino media, connecting with Asian media. But at our very first meeting, it was the Vietnamese asking the Hispanic media reporter what's it like to be Hispanic in a Vietnamese neighborhood? In other words, it was inter-ethnic. It was cross-ethnic. And uh, I, I think what you're doing with the round table is so valuable. We need to hear from each other how we're experiencing very, uh, these very momentous changes in our society, in our culture. And we need to learn from and share from each other the challenge for us in ethnic media is to take our strength, which is our specific focus on a target audience, but it's also a weakness in that we ignore other groups. It's to, it's to build on our audience and expand their exposure to the perspectives of other communities. That is what I see around table as driving us to helping us do and I thank and commend you for it. And I will watch the video because I want to learn what I missed. And I know I'll learn a lot. So my apologies. And I'm honored to be part of the conversation. Well, it looks like you're muted, Odette. We can't hear you. Forgive me for that technical glitch. That's all right. Another mind blank. That's OK. Um, not at all, Sandy, and, and really the, found, the very foundations of cross-cultural communications, of, of communities listening to each other, of, of media professionals listening to each other. I think so much of that, as Martin and the Institute uh, has expressed in terms of the movement that we're seeing in the streets needs to match the movement in our newsrooms, and how can we, as media practitioners and media leaders, um, really foster and strengthen more collaborations with each other. Uh, Martin, there's just a few more uh, in terms of housekeeping points that I can uh, mention yes, to close it out, but I wonder if you may have some last thoughts for us. Okay. Yes, uh, just that I just want to thank all our panelists, uh, 
uh, for your perspectives, for your work, and for your passion. We appreciate your time, and we appreciate that you work that you do. And I think, uh, Odette, you said it well, that uh, the movement in the streets must match, uh, the movement in our newsrooms must match the movement in our streets. And I think I will leave it there in the interest of time. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, uh, been a great privilege, really been so energized to uh, share the Zoom stage with you, lead this session with you, and to just a big uh, thank you as well, echoing your gratitude to, to Rong, to Maria, to Khalil, to Troy, to Sandy, um, for the work that you do in connecting our communities and telling the stories of our communities, one that you have been doing for decades. I want to thank everyone that has attended with us today, has stuck with us. I know we came a little bit over our time. Um, our, our great colleague, Eva Macha, our membership and alumni coordinator, will be in touch as we uh, flashed earlier. Um, all of our updates and events, editorial content, and upcoming digital conversations and webinars are available and, and are announced through our newsletter. If you haven't yet, please do subscribe. And we will also be sending and sharing the recording of this digital dialogue with all of you and perhaps some additional resources and additional insights from our speakers today. And one thing I, I do want to end with is that one of the frameworks and resources that we recently shared with our Maynard Institute Network is the framework of resilience. And we, we say this because we, that is something that we want to continue offering to you in this extremely challenging moment uh, when we are challenged ourselves as media practitioners and telling the story of this pivotal moment in our history of the crises that are hitting us. It, it's so important to make sure that we are, are able to take care of ourselves out there and to take care of each other and and foster that resilience to carry on the work. So I want to thank everyone. I want to thank our colleagues uh, on behalf of our my amazing um, uh, co-moderator, uh, uh, our co-executive director, Martin Reynolds, and our co-executive director, Evan Su. Thank you, everyone. And have a great rest of your day. Hold up the courage. And we'll see you again at our next events. Bye-bye. Stay positive, test negative. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone.